Photo editing might seem like a complicated process, and as a beginner photographer, you might be a little bit confused on where to start. So in today's video, I'll be breaking down my four step process on how you can edit your photos from RAW to WOW using Lightroom. And I'm gonna start right now. So when you go ahead and first open up Lightroom and once you've imported all of your photos, you should be displayed with a library with all of the photos that you've got inside your collection. Now what I'm gonna firstly do is I'm gonna go ahead and choose a photo. So this 684 is the photo that I'm gonna be editing for this tutorial. So what I'm gonna do is go over from the library, I'm gonna go ahead and open up the develop panel. Now like I was saying, we want to break it down into four easy steps and the first step is basically going to be opening up the basics panel. So what we're gonna do is go over to the develop panel and drop all the way down to basics. Now, realistically, you wanna work from top to bottom. The first thing you wanna do is change your overall white balance. Now, if you didn't know this, there are quite a few reasons I recommend shooting in manual white balance. And one of them is actual white balance can change the exposure of your photo. That might seem a little bit confusing at first, but if you go ahead and look at a color wheel, for example, and then go ahead and remove all of the color, so we're just leaving the luminosity of each color, you can see that the blues are far darker than the yellows. And we can see this in graphic design as well. If you have a look at any warning signs, usually they're bright red or bright yellow because they're the largest contrasting color versus black. So it's a very obvious, it's very noticeable when you look at them. And it's the same when it comes to editing photos. If you've got a photo that's really blue or a photo that's really yellow and you change that after you've changed your exposure, you're actually going to indirectly change the exposure as well. So when you are photo editing, the very first step, I do recommend changing the white balance. So let's take this image as an example. Now, it's a sunrise photo I've taken in, uh, I believe it was Canyonlands National Park. This is uh, Mesa Arch. So what I want to do is actually make it slightly warmer. Now, obviously you don't, you can aim for quote unquote, the correct white balance, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right white balance for your photo. For example, if you're editing sunrise, you might want to make it slightly warmer. So in that, in doing so, you might want to actually have a slightly warmer white balance. Now, if you are editing in RAW, you might notice you have got a Kelvin value here. So at the moment I was shooting at 5,600 Kelvin, but if you're shooting in JPEG, you'll just have a plus and minus slider. They basically do the same thing. It's just obviously with RAW, you've got that RAW information built into that photo where with JPEG, you don't necessarily have that customization. So with this image, what I'm actually gonna do is go to my temperature slider here. I'm gonna go ahead and increase that to 6,000 Kelvin. And for the moment, I'm gonna leave the tint alone, although I might adjust that slightly later. Okay, so once you've got your white balance or you're happy with what you're gonna have, have your white balance, then I recommend changing your exposure. And you've got six sliders. You've got your exposure, contrast, highlights, shadows, whites, and blacks. And they really do all the same thing. Exposure changes obviously the entire exposure of the image. And then the others it basically target different parts of your photo's brightness. So obviously highlights, target the highlights, shadows, target the shadows, and so on. Now, if we take a look at this photo here, we can see that it is quite dark. And that's just simply because I exposed for the sky and I didn't expose for the ground. And because there's a large difference in brightness, because as you can see, I wanted to have this sun kind of peeking just over these mountains here. And I want to create that beautiful starburst effect. I wanted to expose for that versus exposing for the shadow. So we're gonna have to fix this photo as it were. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go ahead and just increase my exposure just slightly. Might go to uh, 0.25 stops. Then I've got my highlights here. What I might do is bring that down ever so slightly. The reason is when I head and bring up the shadows here, it brings up a little bit more of an even balance. So what I might do is go for around plus 65. Now in doing so, you might notice that it now looks a little bit gray and matty. And we can fix this by firstly the contrast slider, also the white and black slider. So what I'm gonna do is go to my contrast slider here. I'm gonna go ahead and bring that up a little bit not by much, by around maybe 10. Then with my white slider here, I'm gonna go ahead and bring that up. Now you might be aiming in the dark and that's might be a little bit complicated. So what I recommend doing is holding out Alt or Option, then sliding, and you wanna do is slide it until you start seeing white in the image. As you can see, we've now got white appearing there. And then with our black slider, we're gonna go ahead and slide it over to the left while holding down Alt or Option until you see black. What we're doing is we're correctly setting our white and black points in our photo, which is really what you wanna do if you want the optimum amount of dynamic range. Now it's still looking a little bit too dark, so what I recommend doing now is lastly going to exposure here, 
and brightening that up until you are happy. But don't forget, we're gonna be using the masking panel later on in step three to kind of overall fix the brightness in some areas and darkness in others. Okay, so once you're kind of done with the overall exposure, the last thing you wanna do is go to your texture, clarity and dehaze, and then also our color. So first you wanna to go to a texture, I'm gonna go ahead and just simply increase that. Clarity, now this depends on what style of photo you're working on. If you're working on maybe a landscape photo, for example, I recommend increasing clarity, maybe 10 or 20%. But if you're working with a portrait photo with skin tones or anything like that, then I recommend creating a negative clarity effect. What this will do is it'll smooth out those really important skin tones. But because we're working on a landscape photo, what I recommend doing is going to clarity here and just increasing that ever so slightly, I'm gonna increase it to 10. Now, there isn't much haze in this photo, so what I recommend doing is just adding in a small amount of dehaze there, plus five. Now, the last thing I'll do is I'm just gonna add in vibrance. So I'm gonna go ahead and add in vibrance like so. Now, if you're wanting to know a little bit more information on the difference between a vibrance and saturation, go ahead and watch this video here, but to summarize it, basically vibrance tackles the mid-tone colors where saturation targets the all colors globally. So colors found in the highlights, shadows, and mid-tones, as well as whites and blacks, where Vibrance pretty much just targets those mid-tone colors. So the colors with even amounts of luminosity, ones that you'll find roughly in the middle of the color wheel. Okay, so once you're pretty much happy with that, the last thing I recommend doing with the basics is changing the crop. Now I recommend changing crop first, just because what you don't wanna do is fix all the details in the bottom right-hand corner, and then right at the end, crop it out. So within the basic section of changing or editing photos, I do recommend cropping. So once you're out of the basic slider, go ahead and open up your cropping panel and basically choose a crop that you would like. Now I quite like the three by two, but with Mesa Arch, I quite like this kind of almost panoramic look just because of the shape of the arch. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to my original aspect ratio and I'm gonna drop that down to, let's say 16 by nine. Is that a little bit better? Yeah, I think so. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna place the arch roughly in the middle. So I have the sun almost at the horizon line directly through the center of my image. I think I quite like that. And then I'm gonna go ahead and click enter to confirm and I'm pretty much happy with that overall crop. Now, once you've done that, the last thing I recommend doing is basically just changing the lens correction. Now lens corrections, every lens has a, a personality or a certain look. It has dis distortion, vignetting, chromatic aberration. And realistically, we wanna fix that straight away. So outside the basics panel, drop all the way down to lens correction. And all you'll need to do is just make sure remove chromatic aberration is turned on and enable profile corrections is turned on. And as you can see, the lens profile I was using was the Canon RF 15 to 35 mil f 2.8. So once we've pretty much done all of that, now we can move on to step two, which is color grading. Now, there are many ways of color grading a photo inside Lightroom. The top three or my three favorite tools is the color mixer tool, the color grading tool, as well as the calibration tool. Now inside the color mixer tool, you've got a brand new tool now called point color which basically is like the color mixer tool, but you can be a little bit more precise of what colors you're altering as well as changing. So let's go ahead and go to the color mixer tool first. So it's just underneath tone curve. And what it does is it splits eight color bands into hue, saturation, and luminance. Hue is the type of color. So what color do you want to change? Do you want to change green to red? Well, that's the hue. So you want to change the hue there. Saturation is the amount of color. So for example, if you want to add more red to your photo, go to the red channel and then go ahead and increase it. And then lastly, you've got luminance, which is the brightness of that color. So let's say you want to brighten the greens in your photo, go to the color mixer tool, go to the luminance in green, to that slider, and then go ahead and increase it or decrease it. So as you can see, you've pretty much got full control over all of the colors. Now, in this example, I want to kind of increase and change some of the colors in this image. So what I might do is go to the red here. What I might do is take it over to the left slightly, bringing in a little bit more magenta there. Might do about minus 25. Then with the orange here, I might do the same. Again, you can play around. As you can see, if I slide that over to the right, you can see that the sun has gone from more of an orangey tone to more of a bright yellow tone. Now, I'm not a massive fan of that, so what I might do is slide it the other way, making it a little bit more red. Now again, Canyonlands and kind of Arches National Park, the area which is what I was photographing, is famous for this bright red rock. Uh, kind of delicate arch is very famous. I'm sure you've seen some photos here, some of the ones that I've taken on the trip and it's a very bright color. So I might wanna replicate that in this image as it was shot 
basically the day beforehand. So what I might do is just slightly change that. I might reduce that down a little bit. Now with this, you really just want to experiment, see what kind of works for your style of photography. Uh, most of the time I just play around, just slide it left and slide it right and kind of see what it does to my image. Now, obviously I've got a little bit of experience using this software, so I kind of roughly know what I'm aiming for. But if you don't know, what I recommend doing is just sliding it all the way to the right all the way to the left and roughly see what you like and see if it actually impacts your image. For example, there's very little aquas in my image, so you can see, it doesn't matter where I slide it, it doesn't look like it's changing it, but it might be different for your photo. So if it doesn't change anything, I'll just leave it as zero. And again, with blue, you can see this one's really targeting the kind of sky, as it were. So what I might do is add a little bit more teal to the sky. So I might drop that down by minus 15. Then purple, that's really gonna be impacting the sky. You can see it's kind of impacting the background there. So I might slide that over a little bit, go for 15. And then lastly, magenta, let's see what happens. I might go for, that just doesn't seem to make any changes here. So I might just leave that as zero. So as you can see, I've made some slight changes. A big tip, uh, especially if you're a beginner, don't go too mad with this simply because you'll end up with very strong, very striking, unrealistic colors. And it might not necessarily look that pleasing to the eye. It might look just too, too powerful. So I wouldn't, as a beginner, any, wouldn't go any more than minus 50. Once you're starting to understand how the colors work, then go a little bit more extreme. But most of the time, minus 25 does seem to do quite a good job on most photos. Next we've got is saturation here. Now I quite like the overall saturation, but I might actually increase the saturation of the blues because they're not striking enough. So what I might do is go to the blue here, increase the saturation there a little bit. So I might go for 20. Same with the aquas, I might go for 10 there. Now with the greens, it doesn't seem to be much green in the image. So what I might do is just lower that down so any green that is present is kind of a little bit more of a, kind of a little bit more subtle. And what I might do is go to the red here, increase the red slightly, go for 15. Uh, same with orange, and I might do the same with yellow. Bringing over the saturation overall in this image. And then lastly, we've got our luminance here. What I might do is actually go to the orange, which is predominantly where the sun is. I might brighten that up slightly. Again, with the red. Now the red is obviously gonna impact a large a part of this photo, because obviously pretty much the entire scene is red. So I might increase that by 30. Let's have a see what happens with the orange. Now I don't wanna affect the orange too much, because that's, or the yellow, should I say, because that's basically where the sun is. So I might not impact that at all. And with the, with the sky, I might darken that slightly. Bring that down by around about minus 25. With purple as well, might bring that down slightly, maybe minus 10, and I might leave magenta alone. So as you can see, we've actually made a fairly big impact already, and we've only used one tool. So what I can do is actually go to this little eye tool here, which will basically just disable the color mixer tool specifically. We can do the before and after. You can see there's not a massive change, but I am a lot happier with the result versus the raw image. Now, if you did want to use point color, the tool is just found here. What it basically does is all you need to do is click the eyedropper tool, go ahead and sample a color. So for example, the red rock here, you can see it pops up with this dialog box. And what it does is it allow you to change that color specifically. So instead of changing a color band, you're changing basically one specific hue. So you can be a little bit more targeted. I don't use it in every single photo, but you might find it might be beneficial for your style of editing. It works really well with skin tones when maybe you've made a slight change, you want to revert back or maybe change the color of someone's hair. It works really well because usually they are a lot narrower than just a single color band. But if you wanted to do that, that's something you can do. Again, what you do, right click and you just delete swatch if you just wanna take it back to this main slider here. Okay, so what we'll do, exit out of color mixer tool, we'll move on to color grading. Now color grading, or used to be known as split toning, is basically adding a color to a certain part or luminosity of your image. So shadows, mid-tones, or highlights. And you can see it's broken down into three color wheels. We can blow them up larger by going up to shadows, mid-tones and highlights. So for example, in the highlights, I might wanna add more of a red tone to this image because obviously that's where the sun is. So what I can do is go ahead and add in, choose a hue. So I'm gonna choose a hue of uh, 25. If you're wondering where these sliders are, just click this little arrow here. As you can see, pops up with this little drop down. So I'm gonna choose a hue of 25. And then all you need to do is just add in that saturation. And I'm gonna add in probably around 15%. Now that's a little bit too orange. So what I might do is just take a little bit further. I might choose a hue of 35 instead. And then lastly, you've got your luminance here. You can increase or decrease that. I might increase it slightly by around about 35%. And then with shadows, 
Maybe you want to add in an opposite color. For example, I might want to add in blue. So what I might do is drag this slide around, choose a blue. So I might choose a blue of uh, 215 and then just simply add in saturation. So I might add in a little bit here. Now, if it doesn't work for you, choose another color. So I'm finding that's not, that's quite strong. So I might add in, actually, I might add in another color. I might actually add in yellow, which is a hue of 50. And what we can do is again, toggle it off and on, see if you like it, turn it off before, and after you can see, it's added a very small pop to the image. Now, again, it's a very subtle effect. It's not very strong. So I wouldn't recommend using it too much. Like if you go for it too far, it kind of ruins the image there. So being very subtle with this effect does seem to work really nicely. And again, you can change the luminance there, make it a little bit darker if you wanted to, maybe brighten it up. I might actually make it slightly darker around about minus five there. And lastly, you've got blending and balance. Blending is how much those colors intertwine. So how much the highlights, shadows and midtones co co coincide with each other. And then balance is where those kind of colors are found. So do you want to sway them a little bit more to the right or sway them a little bit to the left of your histogram? So do you want the highlights to affect more of the image and the shadows to affect less? Or do you want the midtones? Kind of move it around. I recommend if you do want to learn more about the color grading panel, I've actually made a masterclass tutorial and I'll make sure to place that in the link in the description. In fact, I've actually made a masterclass tutorial on pretty much everything in Lightroom. So if you do want to learn more, make sure to go ahead and subscribe to this uh, YouTube channel. Okay, so let's go ahead and exit out of color grading. The last one I'm going to show you in this video is calibration. Now calibration is a fairly complicated tool. Uh, I'll probably leave it uh, until you really understand it. If again, if you'd like to learn more, I've got this video here on how you can master the calibration tool, but basically it, it fundamentally changes what red, green, and blue is in your image. Basically the color science of your camera, for example. But we can use this to our advantage in color grading. So for example, in the hue, we can slide that over to the right, we can slide that over to the left, you can see how it impacts our image. Same with green, for example, and then lastly with blue. Now I actually like for this example, I like taking hue, sliding that over plus 15, and then with our blue primary here, I like sliding that over by minus 15. It creates this really nice, almost like teal and orange effect there. Now, it's a little bit too strong. I think the reds now looking at it, so what I can actually do is go to my red primary here and dropping that down by minus 10%, removing 10% of the global saturation of red from our image. So you can see calibration tool is a really cool tool. But again, it's a little bit complicated. So if you do wanna learn more, make sure to go ahead and watch my masterclass tutorial. So that's pretty much all I would do inside the color grading or what I would do in step two of color grading. Next, I'm gonna be showing you how you can use masking. And this is where your photo can really pop. Now, creating local adjustments is a great way to really make your photos pop. Basically highlighting certain parts, darkening others, maybe changing the color. Basically anything you do globally, but now you can do it locally. So you can affect only a certain part of your image. Now, I'm not gonna go over everything that the masking panel can do because it can do almost anything. You can create a mask through using color, luminosity, a radial gradient, a linear gradient, basically anything at this point. So I'm gonna show you kind of three ones that I mainly use in my either landscape or portrait photos. So with this image here, I'm gonna create probably four or five different masks. So the first mask I'm gonna create is to basically work on the sun and work on the highlight sections, then work on the shadows. So firstly, what you wanna do is go over to our masking panel found on the right hand side up here. Then I'm gonna go ahead and go down to radial gradient. Now this radial gradient is gonna be very elliptical. So I'm gonna create click, drag, and I'm gonna go ahead and make an elliptical gradient something like so, putting the center directly onto the sun and covering basically all of that underneath section of the arch. Now with this, what I wanna do is go to, once you've made a mask, it will pop up with this. These are all your mask changes that you can do. So locally, what you can actually change. I'm gonna to go to my exposure here. I'm gonna go ahead and increase that by around about 0.5. So a plus of a stop. Then I'm also gonna go down to the temperature here. I'm gonna go ahead and increase it. Now, like I was saying previously, Changing it from blue, looks like it darkens the image and changing it to yellow. So you can see, color really does have an impact over the overall luminosity. So that's why, again, like I was saying, recommend changing white balance first. So I'm gonna go ahead and add in around 10% there. Then what I'm gonna do is a quick tip. I am gonna go all the way down to clarity. Now, when you're working with really bright highlights, like for example, any light source like the sun, if you wanna create that kind of 
blooming effect, like a, a haze effect, you can do that by actually reducing clarity. Now, obviously, you don't want to do this for the entire image because you'll make the entire image soft. So this is where we can use local adjustments to our advantage. So go to our clarity here and go ahead and reduce that down. And what this will do is it will make the highlights look like they're blooming. So you can see if I go extreme, you can see that it really makes the sun look like it's blooming and it's like a very soft effect to the highlights. Now again, don't go too strong. I'll probably go for minus 25 in this effect, but you can see we've got this lovely blooming effect over the sun, which works really nice in this example. Okay, so once I've done that, what I recommend doing now, I'll go ahead and create a new mask. Now, Mesa Arch is famous for the underside lighting up. And when I was there, you could actually visually see it. It was this beautiful kind of event. Uh, basically, one of the reasons, my reason I went to uh, kind of Utah in general to see this, uh, but it didn't really capture it in the photo annoyingly, just because you know the human eye is always going to be better. So let's emphasize that in Lightroom. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and create a new mask, but instead of creating a gradient or anything like that, I'm going to go ahead and choose Object. Now with Object, you get like a little brush, and basically what it does is you kind of roughly tell uh, what you want Lightroom to, to to kind of select, as it were. It's like an AI selecting tool. It works really well, I think. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just select the bottom of this arch. So just use the paintbrush tool to kind of go around the edge of this arch. I'm gonna go underneath it like so, go around, kind of create a, a kind of a circle or a shape as it were and meet back in the middle. And once you've done that, Lightroom will go, ah, you wanna select this area and it'll kind of work out roughly what to do. And as you can see, it's done a pretty good job. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna go to the exposure here. I'm gonna brighten that up a little bit. Go for something like so. Now it's starting to look a little bit fake. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to my highlight section here. I'm gonna go ahead and increase that. And then to combat that, to kind of remove it from the shadows, go to my shadow region here, or shadow slider, and reduce that down until it's starting to look a little bit natural. Now, if it still looks a little bit fake, go to the black slider here and do the same. So we'll go for something like so. So uh, minus 20 in the shadows minus 15 in the blacks. And what I might do is actually go to the highlights, brighten that up a little bit more. Maybe go for 70. And the last thing I recommend doing is going to exposure again, just fixing that. Okay, so as you can see, we've got that little bit of a brightness there. Again, it looks natural, but it still looks a little bit better, I think, than it did in RAW. And then lastly, I might go to my temperature here, just brighten that up a little bit, just by adding a little bit of yellow. I might add in around 15% there. Lovely, so now we've got the underside of that arch lit. Let's add a little bit more of a blooming effect to the uh, kind of left-hand side and then darken the right-hand side. So what I wanna do, create another mask. I'm gonna go down this time to radial gradient. I wanna go ahead and create a nice big gradient, put it right over the sun. This one's gonna be nice and subtle. So I'm gonna go to my exposure here, just increase that by 0.25, making basically the left-hand side brighter than the right-hand side. And to emphasize this further, what you can do is create a new mask. And this time I'm gonna go ahead and create a linear gradient this time. And then what I'm gonna do is just darken the bottom section, the bottom right of this photo. So we've got the bright side, and then we've also got the dark side. It works quite nice for this style of image. So I'm gonna pray ahead and darken that down. I wouldn't go further than minus 0.5 of a stop, so 0.5 of a stop. And then again, you can play around with, for example, might add a little bit of contrast in there, might bring up the highlights, might bring down those shadows just a little bit. And then I might add in a 10% white and minus 10% black. And again, you can adjust that after the fact. But as you can see, it's really now starting to come together. And what you can do is if you want to see wow, each mask works or what it's done to your image. You can actually go to that mask here. You can even press the little uh, eye icon and see before and after. You can do that with each one of our images. So you can see effects there. That works really nice. How well that works. That's come, that's come out really nicely there. And again, if you would like to learn more about this, again, I have made a masterclass tutorial all about the masking panel. I'll make sure to place that in the link in the description. You can add to that mask, you can subtract to that mask, you can intersect it with another mask, you can be really creative with, uh, with this tool. But that's basically what I would recommend doing is just creating a few masks, basically highlighting certain parts of your photo, removing interest from others, and you can create a real interesting look with masking. Now, I barely scratched the surface with masking. There's so much more you can do, but yeah, that's what I would roughly do if I was working on this image in Lightroom. Okay, so let's move on to step four, which is the details. 
So what do I mean by details? Well, things like, for example, sharpening your image, or maybe removing ISO noise, or even adding in post effects like post cropping vignette, or even adding ingrain if that's something you want to do. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go to my details panel over here, and what this will do is it will split into two sections, sharpening and noise reduction. Now, as you can see by the uh, histogram at the top, we've got our metadata. So I shot this at ISO 100, 20 mil, F16 at a tenth of a second. And obviously I was using a tripod. Now, because we're shooting at ISO 100, if we go ahead and zoom in, there's very little grain, but there's a little bit you can see in the background. So what we can do is go to our manual noise reduction. We could go ahead and remove that like so, just by increasing these sliders. So you're happy with these sliders. So luminance, obviously, the more you increase it, the more it removes ISO noise. Detail works on the edges of shapes. So the lower you have that, the less it makes impacts of the shapes. And then lastly is the contrast. So the contrast between brights and darks. And basically that's how the color noise production works as well as luminance. So you've got your color here, obviously impacts the color ISO noise and luminance affects the luminance ISO noise. And again, you've got detail and smoothness all within that. Again, if you'd like to learn more, I have made a masterclass tutorial. And if you do wanna know more about it, you've also got this denoise button, which basically creates a brand new DNG, uh, which basically AI can remove ISO noise, which is, works quite nicely. And lastly, you've got the sharpening up here. Again, I wouldn't go too crazy with this, but I'll probably go to maybe 50 in this example. Just working on the sharpening and noise reduction of this image. Now, another thing you can do is go all the way down to effects, and you've got two effects that you can add if you wanted to, like for example, post cropping vignetting, as well as grain. In this example, I'm probably not going to add anything, but I might actually add in a small amount of vignette um, let's see, should I add a vignette in? Yeah, let's add a smaller in vignette. Let's go for minus five. And again, you've got midpoint roundness and also feather there as well. I might actually remove it a little bit from the sky by just increasing the highlight section there. And again, if you'd like to add in grain, that's something you can do as well. And there we go. That is my four step process. But there is one more thing that I would usually do if I'm posting to a photo online, for example. Instagram is a great example. This photo I love, but it's not the best aspect ratio for Instagram. So let me show you how we can change the aspect ratio without cropping. Okay, so what I've done is I've opened this photo up in Photoshop. Now, as you can see, got it open up here. Now for Instagram, I recommend choosing the aspect ratio of four by three. But if we do that, if we go over to our crop tool, you can see it crops in on the image. And even if we go ahead and move it over to the left, you can see that all the whole right hand side is missing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and make it to the full size or the full crop of our image. But in doing so, we've now got transparent pixels on the top and bottom. Now obviously if we upload that to Instagram, it looks a little bit odd. So now what we can do is use generative fill to basically fill in the top and bottom pixels. And all you will need to do is just go ahead and click generate. Now I've talked about generative fill before and the main reason I love using it is that generative expand where we can actually expand or uncrop our image. So instead of cropping in and ruining that kind of aspect ratio that you had, you can just uncrop it. It doesn't work in necessarily every single example, but hopefully in this example it will work or at least I'm hoping so. And as you can see, it's actually done a quite good job. So we've got option one, which doesn't look too good at the bottom here. We've got option two, which looks better. And now option three, ah. There we go, option three, I'm gonna choose option three. And as you can see, this photo now looks amazing. We've got this really cool crop and we haven't lost any of that awesome shot that we had previously. So my final tip and kind of 0.5 tip, cause I wouldn't call this a full tip, is use geometry fill to your advantage. Uncrop your photos so you don't lose all of that amazing aspect ratio that you had, but you can change it and adapt it for different websites, for example, your own gallery, or in my case, Instagram. And there we go. So there is my four step process on how I edit photos in Lightroom. And don't forget my bonus tip of using generative fill. Again, if you've taken a landscape photo, but you want to display it for Instagram and you want it to be four by three, just chuck it into Photoshop, use generative fill to get the perfect aspect ratio. So you don't have to crop in on your photos, you can actually crop out, getting that absolute perfect aspect ratio for Instagram. And of course, if you'd like to learn more, go ahead and subscribe to this YouTube channel. I create new videos on Lightroom, Photoshop, and photography in general every single week. I've been James for Photo Fever, and I'll catch you guys next time.